This is the last episode after the last episode. This is Control Structure, episode 141, for March 24th, 2018. Would you like a survey today? This show has notes. Visit thenexus.tv slash cs141 to see them. Wait, does that mean you went to the subway? Yes, it did. Did you like a survey? Um, complicated story. I'll tell it later. Okay. Uh, that was uh, one of the hosts, Stephen Orvis, and I'm your other host, Andrew Bailey. Hi, Andrew. Hi, Steve. So, yes, I did go uh, to Subway today. Uh, I went to it yesterday as well uh, for, like, the first time in two weeks. So he was really wanting me to do a survey. (laughs) It's like, please, Andrew. (laughs) So, and then today I asked to do one because I'm not going to be there for, like, another week or so. Oh, he's like, save the drawer and submit it later. (laughs) Well... Well, no, like I, you know, went ahead and did it and everything. Uh-huh. Uh, coincidentally, he's going to be out just as long as I am. Oh, there you go. For the same days. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> raspberry? 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 Raspberry! <laughs> no neighbors! <laughs> Man, you're really ramped up fast. Oh, well, I mean, you know... I haven't done it in a while. <laughs> yeah, you're really... I, I find I'm a really outgoing and, like, sparkly, bubbly person when I haven't talked to people for a long time. So, yeah, anyways. Well, at least you woke up. I, I mean, because I've been, like, working remotely, like, out there in the middle of the woods for quite a long time with the wolves and And all you that. can shout as much as you want out there. You can, sometimes. <laughs> anyways. I mean, my neighbors are a few hundred yards away, but, eh, it's okay. <laughs> Anyways, so, the uh, Raspberry Pi model, B plus uh, 3 model, was released, featuring faster Ethernet power over Ethernet with a hat, which I'm not sure if that's quite fair, but fine, whatever, and uh, the support for booting off of uh, Ethernet now, too. Yep. So I wasn't sure if it could do that before, and it says improved uh, support. So I guess it's less hacky now? Less hacky, Okay. And then it says a USB mass storage booting, which I thought that was pretty cool. That's kind of a good obvious one because sometimes I'm going to boot from my flash drive. Yeah. Uh, that would also give me a way to boot up into a new system and pull the drive and go boot something else. So I think that's a pretty cool feature yeah. there. Because I don't always have an SD card. So it's cool to be able to boot up the flash drive. Yes. Uh, it, note, it is to be noted here that uh, faster Ethernet uh, means gigabit Ethernet, but over USB 2. So that means it's not the full potential. If it updates to 3.0 someday, then it can realize better speeds. Yeah. Um, or, like, it can just have, like, a dedicated inter- interface for it. Um, but, yeah, you should be able to hit 300 uh, megabits uh, pretty easily. Pretty cool chip. They've gone a lot, of way- a lot of ways with this since the first Raspberry Pi. Just thinking through what all, what all that one had. And <laughs> I don't like it to have the Ethernet on it at all and just something really basic pretty good chip now i could that's that's uh you can do do some uh standalone just like web browser type of computer someplace yeah. pretty pretty anything so and uh, also it has dual band wi-fi so and it also has like heat spreaders and everything so oh nice uh because uh things are getting a little toasty it's becoming its own classic computer yes and now for this episode's lol apple uh, Apple? No, we didn't scream Apple, okay. <laughs> no, we don't. Okay. Um, so, you know how Apple is, you know, mostly known for iPhones and stuff, right? Mostly, and just for, for yeah, iPhones. Various other fanboyish... Apple, Apple watches. Fan, fanboyish iPads snobbery. I this and I that. Fanboyish snobbery sometimes. Yeah, like the Apple taxi things and white, <laughs> like big white boxes and like... Like a fakey apple that's not red and things like that. Yeah. A white apple. Have you ever seen a white apple? Like an actual fruit? Yeah. Have you ever seen a white apple? No. Me neither. <laughs> so, like, it's all, like, monolithic and oppressive yes, looking. Very oppressive. Modernistic and, yeah. So, um, it turns out that people aren't buying as many smartphones as they once were. Uh, 
So for the first time in ever, uh, which is goes back, uh, what, since 2004, since Gartner started tracking these things, uh, in the fourth quarter of 2017, smartphone sales fell for the first time ever. Uh, they sold nearly 408 million smartphones, down 5.6% from the period a year previous. Uh, so, yeah, turns out that smartphones are getting fast enough that mm. people are holding on to them. I think the other aspect there, too, is a good bit of people have transitioned away from the traditional phones. Like, There's still people out there. But most of them have transitioned over and have a smartphone now. So that's pretty common. Like, my parents have smartphones. Yeah. I mean, it's at that level that technology is accessibility to the technology. It's just most people have one now. It's pretty commonplace. So I think they've hit that market cap. So that probably would be a decrease in growth. But then I think, too, what you said as well. And you get a pretty decent phone for pretty cheap now. Like, my phone's like a $58 phone from Walmart. I, I paid more for it because it was an unlocked phone. But if you could get basically the same phone for 50 bucks from Walmart. And it's like, at that point in time, a phone that's decent for a few years, like that's quite reasonable and not too shabby. Yep. So there's something rotten over at Google. A YouTube recruiter was fired because he didn't hi- hire enough people that weren't white or Asian men. That kind of struck me as odd. The Asian? I was like, that's not what I was expecting. So they are racist against Asians. Yes. And so like, okay, interesting. Um... So, uh, apparently out in California, where they are based out of, that, uh, you know, like a lot of the employees uh, that are working for tech companies, there is a lot of Asians working. So is that kind of like the Indian equivalent over over here, how we have a lot of Indians? They also have quite a few Indians, too. Oh, okay. So, like, by Asian, they're meaning, like, you know, like East Asian, yeah. Japanese, Korean, mm-hmm. Chinese. Um so this lawsuit uh, filed, you know, in whatever court, uh, but wasn't reported in the media for a few days, comes at a time when many Silicon Valley companies uh, are becoming increasingly cognizant of their uh, workforce demographics. Uh, according to the lawsuit, uh, was it Arne Wilberg uh, received high marks for his performance as a recruiter uh, for YouTube. Uh, until he began pushing back against Google's efforts to hire a more diverse workforce. Uh, his manager informed him that, uh, formed Wilberg and his colleagues, that they were to only accept a certain rank of engineers uh, if, they were di- if they were diverse. Um, so, you know, like this is, you know, sort of hammers on to uh, James Damore from last year, uh, who... Uh, you know, posted that, uh, you know, there's, you know, some difference between men and women. Uh, But, you know, this is like more on the, you know, racial side of Mm -hmm. things that it, you know, shouldn't matter. Yeah, Uh, you shouldn't be specifically targeting people of certain colors specifically. Yeah. Because that is discriminatory. Yeah. So, you know, whatever whatever happened to, you know, may the best win, Mm -hmm. you know. I love the quote from Google there of the response. I think it's towards the end of the article. Uh, you're able to find it there. Oh, yeah, there you go. Uh, in state, a statement, Google said that it would vigorously defend the lawsuit, adding that it was a clear policy to hire candidates based on the merit, not their identity. Great. <laughs> then it goes on to say, at the same time, we unapologetically try to find a diverse pool of qualified candidates for open roles, as this helps us hire the best people, improve our culture, and build better products. So they say one thing, and then, no, actually, we're not really. We do this <laughs> other thing here. It's just a fancy way of saying, nope, yeah. not doing it. Anyways, I identify as an other <laughs> just in case you ever good wanted. for you uh, so now we uh, see when was the last time we talked about Java we talk about it a lot yeah uh, maybe like a few months ago that was probably the last time I was here yeah <laughs> so uh, Java EE or rather Java Enterprise Edition has been renamed Jakarta EE uh, after Oracle got all mad about their uh, uh, copyrights and patents and stuff. So is this meaning as in the, the organization producing that uh, framework, they are not no longer tied to Oracle and they're not allowed to use the Java brand name? Is that what the deal is? Correct. Or? Okay. So uh, 
as let's see, I think I think we actually was talked about this uh, a while back that uh, Java was handed over from Oracle to the Eclipse Foundation. I vaguely remember something. Yeah, like Eclipse of the Sun Microsystems. Yeah, Sun <laughs> yeah. Microsystems. I, we used to have a word processor for, for Sun. Ah, yeah. it's like the precursor to oh, yeah, okay. like Star Office. Writer or Star Office. Star Office. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, like they've pretty much completely rebranded some of the elements of the Java ecosystem. Uh, for instance, Glassfish, uh, one of my favorite uh, Java uh, servers, is now Enterprise Java uh, Enterprise Glassfish. Everything sounds cooler with the name Enterprise in front of it anyways. Uh, <laughs> really? <laughs> and and the, one of the most confusing uh, things is the Java community process has been renamed the Eclipse EE dot next working group. Yeah, that, that, yeah, okay. that sounds very enterprisey. <laughs> I, yeah, very friendly. Um, so yeah, I uh, I guess this is okay since it sort of uh, you know goes along the uh, whole uh, you know clever application of geography. So so now it's no longer called Java, but it's called Jakarta. Okay. Well, well. Maybe not the whole, like, maybe not Java itself, but the Java Enterprise Edition oh, okay. is apparently the Jakarta Enterprise Edition. What's the difference in the Enterprise and just, like, the... Or just Enterprise giving, like, server support? And yeah, things? pretty much. Okay. Uh, so it's like ASP.NET, kind of. Yeah, kind of stuff. whereas, like, Java is, like, the language in the runtime and, like, some very basic APIs mm -hmm. for, like, you know, accessing files and stuff. Yeah. Terminal stuff. The good, the good things in life. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, you know, because... Uh, let's see. It, it's kind of kind of a genius, I think. Because, like, you know, Java is not only the name of coffee, which, you know, Java is sort of like, you know, plays along with. Mm -hmm. You know, there's Java beans yeah. and whatnot. Yeah. Um, so it's... I'm pretty sure, like, the coffee is named after an island. Uh, which oh, is really? which is in Indonesia, uh, and Jakarta is a city on Java. Oh, that is really cool. Yes. Okay. Okay. Very cool. Yes. Uh, so yeah, speaking of uh, Java, uh, the JDK ten has been released uh, as of like a few days ago. Uh, so you know they are m moving towards a more uh, time-based release schedule uh -huh. because we are stuck on Java 8 for what seemed like forever. Uh, or maybe was that Java 7? I don't know. Between the two, it was probably the same for like 10 years or something. Uh, so, yeah, I definitely uh, approve that, you know, sort of, you know, moving the ecosystem and features and stuff forward. Yep. Do you, any notable things that you're like, oh, that's really cool, if they added or not really? Uh, no. I guess I'm sort of, uh, uh, like, more looking forward to the uh, Jakarta EE release. Uh, -huh. uh, that will add some more support for TLS features. I'm scanning the list there a little bit. Garbage collection interface is like, you don't normally call it GC anyways. Thread local handshakes. Negative. Okay, Better. root certificates. Apparently, uh, like, the, uh, was it the Open JDK? Like, the Java specification does not have any kind of uh, TLS root certificates in it. Oh, really? Until now. Oh, okay, so now you have can get your levels of trust from it. Yeah. De provide a default set of root certification authority certificates in the JDK. Okay, cool. So, uh, something else. Uh, remember VLC? Oh, yes. Uh, VLC has uh, released a version 3.0, uh, which provides support for... Uh, a few more video features like HDR, like HDR video, uh -huh. be, uh, to go along with your HDR monitor. Um, so, what, what's the three six S up there? There's one that shows a three sixty that for viewing certain types of images. I wonder. Uh, let's see, supports three sixty video, video and three audio. audio. Cool. I wonder yeah. what that is. So, uh, three sixty video sample. I wonder if such a thing exists. Yeah, I think uh, YouTube actually has a few. Well, maybe maybe we can check it out after the yeah. podcast. Yeah, uh, and apparently, hey, speaking about Java, Blu-ray Java menus. Blu-ray. I thought that was the one that died. 
Am I wrong? Uh, Which one died? Uh, H- HD DVD. HD, okay, it's been so long. I mean, okay. Be realistic. The internet happened, and the whole discussion became irrelevant. Yeah, more or less. <laughs> like we had like this. Like, I remember reading articles as a kid about you know which one's gonna win. Like this is gonna be quite a fight. This is like you know it was H tracks speech. It's like this is gonna be the fight of the century. And it's like Netflix, YouTube, and it's like no one uses DVDs anymore. It's like what's the well, thing? Well, plenty of plenty of people still yeah. do. I mean, we still use them, but it's just. Not the common mode. Like, I feel like that's more watching's got to happen. Yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah. I see you do have disc, Andrew. Good for you. Yay! Uh, but it's just the common mode, though, is is more the internet now in this in this age. Anyways, so uh, speaking about those format wars, mm-hmm. like remember how people were saying is like, oh, Blu-ray is from Sony and they failed with uh, Betamax. Like, remember people making that comparison? I vaguely. I, I vaguely remember. I think we discussed it on the podcast once upon a time. Yeah. Uh, but the thing that people don't realize is that Sony, like, it seems like their whole business model is just making media formats. Yeah. You know, like... Selling discs and things like that. Well, there's that. Do you know how many uh, flavors of memory stick there are? There's got to be at least a dozen. Yeah. And, uh... Weren't they one of the top floppy drive producers? Well, about that... Uh, you know, sure, you know, Sony made Betamax, and that really didn't do too mm. well. Uh, they also were instrumental in the three-and-a-half-inch floppy disk mm. and CD-ROM. It's not like anybody used those in the 90s. No. <laughs> Everyone downloaded everything from the dial-up internet. It was so fast back then. Yeah, and like, That was before the internet was crowded. Yeah, uh, but no one goes there anymore. No. <laughs> Uh, yeah, like, people just hung on to their eight and flat, eight and five inch floppies. Mm. Yeah, no one ever used those small I, ones. The, the small ones, like, they didn't even flop. Like, they called them floppies, but they didn't flop. Like, that wasn't yeah. any fun. Like, the big ones, they flopped their fun. Yeah, and everyone pretty much went straight to DVD. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Cause they spin, they're more fun. Yeah, and people just, you know, stuck with VHS because, you know, screw Sony. <laughs> Uh, fun times. Uh, so this is maybe a little bit late, uh, but AMD finally released their, uh, uh, their Zen CPUs with a, uh, you know, with an integrated graphics chip in it. Uh, so they took their Zen CPU and like, like, I'm not sure if you recall how, for instance, my Ryzen CPU has a cluster of four cores and another cluster of four cores. And, like, there's, like, some sort of, like, a fabric between them. Okay. So what they did is they took out one of those clusters and put it in a GPU. Okay. So I'm not sure if they have a die shot here. Uh, Well, they sort of do. So you got the CPU side, then you got the GPU side. Uh, And the performance is not too bad for the price. Infinity fabric. Uh, So, in fact, it's... uh, so cheap that I've already built Pastor a computer with one of these. Very nice. And he is very satisfied with my old graphics card in there. <laughs> Which... So wait, wait, you bought a processor with the graphics card chip on it and then put a graphics card in it anyways? Yeah. Okay, just because they're cheaper chips? Yeah. Yeah. So, and, you know, Pastor isn't rather a... is not a very vociferous gamer. Mm. I mean, he pretty much plays Call of Duty and Assassin's Creed, oh, okay. and not much else. So he might play solitaire, but you could use a calculator for that. Well, I'm, I'm the one who's three point one used to play it. I was, yeah, I was one of the staples of that and that Minesweeper. <laughs> um, but speaking about that, uh, Zen-based CPUs uh, have some big flaws in them. So. Uh, there's uh, some flaws in the uh, security processor, uh, that little chip in there that's essentially a black box that you really can't do anything about. Um, then there's uh, a bug in the chipset uh, that you know essentially allows someone to access you know any part of memory they want to. Mm-hmm. Uh, but according to AMD, it seems like these uh, are should are or should be fixable through uh, firmware or BIOS updates. That's good. So, uh, that sounds like someone rushed to market, though. 
Maybe. Windows Vista? <laughs> Maybe, but then again, uh, Meltdown, or was it Spectre, the, the big one that affected the Intel chips. Mm-hmm. That, that's been going on for years. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Fair enough. Uh, but seemingly only affected Intel chips. So, whereas the other one was more general and could be attacked by anyone. Yes, I remember that, yeah. Um, but, you know, how should I say this? The uh, process of disclosing this was kind of peculiar uh, in that the uh, researchers who discovered this uh, told AMD and then the day after told everyone else. As they give them one day to patch it. <laughs> the, hey guys, just so that, you know, this is bug and you better fix it fast. Not, not just a bug. There's these like 10 or 12 bugs. Okay. <laughs> um, better, so, better get on that there, guys. Yeah. Uh, so there's evidence that uh, it may have been financially motivated. Oh, the quick turnaround for the bug. Well, there's that and the whole, let's see what kind of crap we can dig up on AMD's oh, latest really? product. Uh, uh, so, like, you know, like I'm not, I haven't exactly looked too much into this. Uh, let's see. But I'm not sure where this quote came from. If it was, like, one of the guys at the research uh, company that did this. AMD must see sale of Ryzen and Epic chips in the interest of public safety. Uh, and AMD shares should be zero dollars. That's the one. Oh. Um, but yeah. Uh, there might be something fishy going on, but at least AMD has acknowledged, okay, there are some problems here. Okay. So it's some foundation of truth. Yeah. It's interesting. Uh but uh, let's go to something that's at least somewhat more secure. And first by starting uh, with Chrome, saying that all HTTP sites are not secure, which I'm pretty sure this is going to cause a lot of people to freak out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> a lot of webmasters to be- hate Google. <laughs> ah, I have to go to let's encrypt com now. <laughs> it's like all, it's all, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, it's a, uh, it's all a hoax or a scam. That's it, scam. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse you. Excuse me. Uh, speaking of Let's Encrypt, uh, they now have support for wildcard certificates. Uh, and they have updated their Acme API to V2. Um, so uh, with this wildcard certificates, uh, they must be validated using the DNS01 challenge type which means you will have to add DNS TXT records in order to demonstrate your control over a domain. Uh, so I guess we'll all have to update our Let's Encrypt clients. Uh, but uh, you know about patents and stuff and how icky and murky they can be, right? They can be interesting sometimes. Uh, so do you know what uh, MPEG-2 is? Your video encoding format. Yes. Um, hey, we just mentioned DVDs. Yes. Uh, MPEG-2 is used on DVDs. Um, so uh, now uh, all patents covering MPEG-2 have expired, oh. except except in the Philippines and Malaysia for some reason. Okay. <laughs> uh, so now you can at least uh, build the video decoder part of a DVD player without having to you know license any patents. So now that DVDs are out of use, we can build DVDs cheaply. Or DVD well, players, I mean. Well, DVDs are good enough. Mm. I mean, you know, granted they are SD, but, I mean, yeah. at least they don't have horrible compression artifacts like YouTube does. Yeah. We're a goose itch date. It's like the fuzz and stuff. It was funny that, because, you know, I grew up watching really bad VHS tapes with the, you know, you used to, how you used to have the EP mode and the, I think it was SP or something. Yeah. Better... Well, I never could tell the difference until then I said I'd been watching DVDs and stuff, and I went back, I was watching between different uh, VHS pieces of the whole, I can really tell the quality difference. <laughs> I never could as a kid, though. It was funny, just the perspective was changed, because we're used to the good quality now. Yeah. Just a better picture. It's like, yeah, we've been spoiled. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, basically. Uh, so, I remember, have I been pwned? Yes. That, yes, that one website that can tell you if your uh, password has been leaked in mm-hmm. pretty much any, uh, well, 
not Maybe any, the, but the, some commonly known hacks. Yeah. Yes, and even some less commonly known hacks that I didn't know about. Uh, so, have I been owned? Have I been pwned? Has been updated uh, with uh, some more things enough to apparently increment the version number uh, to V2. Uh, and it now contains uh, 501 million passwords. Uh, so, uh, let's see. Yeah, then Troy Hunt, the guy who runs it, mm-hmm. uh, you know, also goes through about how uh, how he was, you know, caching it and optimizing it, uh, you know, putting it behind Cloudflare. So yeah, that's kind of the cool part because he really leveraged Cloudflare to because uh, he set up his API for people to use if they want to and. It could be quite quite uh, expensive for him to run, but it's pretty neat what he's done with Cloudflare. So, I haven't looked too deeply into this, uh, but you know, it's an, a resource provided to you know, how does it? One of the security recommendations is to not use a password that has been in a previous leak. Mm. Uh, so you can use this to you know, if you're building a login page. Uh, use this to say, "Oh, you've uh, your password has been leaked. Uh, please change it, or please use another one." Another cool thing he did. Uh, he made the point that sometimes people will, uh, even though it's been in a leak, it's it's hard to find passwords that haven't been in a leak for some people. And so he's saying you could even, uh, based on the number, because you add the number of times that a password's been leaked into the his data set. Uh, that would allow them to know that. And then, well, maybe, as long as it's only been, like, three times, you can use it. But <laughs> maybe not the best, but at least it gives people the option. I thought that was interesting. But it gives neat stats as far as passwords when you're just looking at different ones just to see how common some passwords really are. So, speaking about passwords, um, someone has devised a very clever way to steal passwords with CSS. Uh, so... With CSS, you can query the attributes of uh, like any particular part of a page. So, like when you're writing a you know some HTML, like you can you know apply classes to certain elements. Uh, you can use CSS to query on those uh, or pretty much any other arbitrary attribute, uh, including values of passwords, and you can query based on if you know, this attribute ends in a certain character. And with that, uh, you can, say, apply a background image to this uh, password field. And uh, with that, make a different request for each keystroke in that password field. So uh, you can look at a log of those and say, okay, so this guy's password is this, because I can see him typing in Mm -hmm. his password... (laughs) It's really clever just what they did there with the image and it showing up. That it. It was, it was kind of neat. Yeah. So uh, at least the example he gives does not uh, use the full range of characters I use in my passwords. <laughs> uh, because they have, how should I say, very interesting characters in them. Mm. So, you know, then I was starting to think, it was like, okay, should browsers even allow this? You know, is there like any kind of legitimate reason to query the uh, value of a password field? It's a good question. So, so yeah, another month, another Windows kernel bug that Bruce Dawson found. Uh, so, like when I came across his uh, blog again, I'm like, I've I've seen this guy before. Like, what does he actually do? Well, apparently, he's one of the guys that develops Chrome for Windows. Uh huh. So he's all the time building, you know, Chrome from scratch, and you know, by doing this, he can see very interesting bugs that hardly anyone else would come across. Uh, so uh, he's found a bug in the Windows file cache, where if you know there's a whole bunch of disk activity and you've just compiled an executable file of some sort and you try to run it or link it or something, that you just get a whole bunch of zeros. Which is the uh, supposedly a very specific use case to a build server or someplace. So yeah. it's not really a normal and, person bug. Yeah, and even that, you need like a 24-core machine. Mm. 
It was very interesting, nevertheless, how he troubleshooted it and his just his mindset and his process beyond figuring it out. Yeah, so he eventually figured out how to you know flush these file buffers to disk uh, before continuing on in the process, uh, and he uh, submitted a uh, you know submitted a bug fix to the uh, repo. repo. Uh, avoid Windows kernel bug using Python hack. So, uh, so yeah, he you know goes through, does a bug trace, uh, then hands it off to you know some guy at Microsoft or used to work for Microsoft mm. or something. Um, so yeah, that's I guess that's another uh, you know another mark in his uh, you know tally list, I guess. Uh, so let's 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 review like some of the stuff he's he's done. He's uh, found that building Chrome very quickly uh, causes uh, like one of the service processes to leak handles. Uh, each build can leak up to sixteen hundred process handles, and thus about a hundred megs of RAM. That becomes a problem when you do three hundred builds in a weekend. Goodbye, thirty-two gigabytes of RAM. Um, and then let's see. So do you think Windows hates him? <laughs> there's that. And then there's the, uh, when you rapidly close a whole bunch of processes, that there's a lock in kernel space huh. when a process ends. Uh, that apparently doesn't affect Windows 7. Hmm. So yeah, keep on doing that and uh, you know make Windows better. So I would like to appreciate time-based one-time passwords. Uh, so we are sort of talking about this in the fringe, uh, about uh, was it uh, key pass and uh, like how how you would you know get things into a browser. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, it's pretty interesting how uh, it's usually the server, so Google or Amazon or whoever, uh, you know, generates a you know random sequence uh, that gives to you, and you're supposed to put that into you know, your one-time password manager or into KeyPass or into Google Authenticator on your phone. Uh, and then it does a hash over that secret and the time uh, divided by, like, 30. So uh, that one-time password is only valid for 30 seconds. So, like, instead of using, say, SMS, you know, like, for instance, like, Google can send you an SMS, or, like, Steam doesn't exactly use the same thing, but, uh, like, the same idea of, like, emailing you yeah. the one-time use code. I think I have gotten an email from Steam before from my one-time use code. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, this is essentially the process of that, uh, but instead of, like, it sending you, you can generate it on your own. Which is neat, because then that means that your weak link of them communicating it to you isn't there. Just that initial time of your secret key. Yep. So, it's it's simple and, I guess, good enough. And easier to type six characters versus 30 or 40. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, anything else? Oh, oh, pretty much it. Um, so, you know, if you would like to uh, submit uh, submit a survey or give us feedback or anything, go ahead and do so on the nexus.tv uh, on the show notes page just below our pretty faces. Uh, and don't forget that today is International Backup Awareness Day, so back up all your one-time password codes. Um, so, yeah, and also uh, my company is hiring, and so is yours. Yep. Uh, so if you would like to work in e-commerce, you can uh, work with me. Or if you want to do .NET, <laughs> you can work with me. <laughs> On, like, pharmacy management software, right? Yes, basically. So, uh, let's see. I'm guessing yours is probably on-site, or you're yeah. doing remote. It would be on-site for yeah. what they're looking for. Yep. Mine, too. Uh, and if, you, if you're if uh, you not a long-time listener, you know that there are some vacancies in this town. Uh, so, you know, it's... It's not like some other big cities where the rent just keeps on going up astronomically. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, I'm going to be off from work. Uh, 
I guess, <laughs> kind of weird after I said, like, yeah, we're hiring. <laughs> I'm not working now. <laughs> That's their hiring to replace for your vacation. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, yep, there's that. And then, uh, yeah, you're still nose to the grindstone, I guess. Yeah, pretty much. Yep. All right. So, uh, I guess that's it. So, uh, watch for cars. Okay. Have a good one.